Welcome viewers. Our guest today is Helen Knott, a community member of our Peace Region. She's an activist as well as an artist. Welcome Helen. Thank you, Faisal. So please tell us first of all a little more about your roles in the community, about yourself as a community member of our Peace Region. Yep, um, for a while here I was a family navigator, which is kind of like a, a social worker for the region. So I would travel from here to Fort Nelson and then go out to communities. Right now I'm just focusing on my master's program that I'm doing through UNBC, but still living here. And I fill a lot of roles from like writer, poet, going to the high school and doing things with them there in their poetry group and then um, activist, I guess. Thank you. And what are the best things you like about our peace community? I love um, living in the north and I feel like there's a solid core community that really cares about this place and there's some amazing people here. Thank you. And please tell us about the history of Aboriginal communities in our community. Wow. <laughs> um, I was talking about this the other day, but just like that, uh, that history runs deep. Like my great great grandfather signed the treaty in 1911 up towards Fort Nelson. And, you know, here, um, I guess settl the settler relationship evolved a lot later in comparison to the rest of Canada. So we're looking at like in the late 1700s and then that trade, fur trade relationship starting. And I know stories of like first contact. So those oral stories still exist. And then looking at, you know, after um, the treaty signing, how that, I guess this element's kind of expanded from then on. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot within our history that I don't think is known either, and especially Indigenous history or Deniza history, which is also, you know, involved with Cree history as well. And then we have um, Soto, the, the nation that's been here with us for a long time as well. Right, thank you. And when did you start your role as an activist? Um, I think... I was saying today that, you know, as an Indigenous person, you're kind of born into a political context, whether you want it or not. So one can argue from, from birth, but um, uh, I think in 2011, I went as an Indigenous Youth Ambassador with um, a couple organizations to Geneva, Switzerland. And so I was able to speak at a pre-session regarding the UN Declaration on the Oh no, the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. And so I spent some time there and I think that was my first exposure to this, um, using voice at a larger platform. And what does peace, justice and equality mean to you? Peace, justice and equality. I think that's something that a lot of us, you know, in community and larger levels strive for, to be able to build here in Canada a future together. And I think that it's, you can't have one without the other. They're kind of like a trinity almost. Like you need peace, justice, and equality because you're not going to have peace without the other two, right? And how to go about getting that. So I think a lot of us carry that within our work and our roles as um, activists or other. And what are the issues which you have highlighted so far? Um, quite a few. I think the primary one that I've been focusing on lately and that I'm going to be doing my thesis work around is looking at the connection between violence against Indigenous women and the violence against Indigenous lands and how those two are related and a lot of issues kind of spawned from that and then of course um, Site C has been a big issue that I focused a lot of time on also connected to that and um, I think that those are the primary ones that I've I've worked on. And what are the causes of some of these issues? Is it mostly economics, resources? What's your opinion? Oh, I think there's multiple things and I think you know the the issues can't be brought in super large because they all have their contextual histories. So if we're looking at the peace region um, specifically too, there's you know there is the the economic portion um, when we look at the oil and gas industry 
and how the cost of living has increased, which then thrusts like the lower levels or the people who are just getting by into poverty lines and how that creates a risk for violence or even access to resources as women. Like I know personally, like I have a bachelor's degree and um, because this is my home, I wanna live here, but it's also a struggle to make ends meet even with a degree, right? If you're not working in a specific field. Um, and then we have a portion that's more uh, socio-cultural, I guess, where we look at, um, vi not violence, but stereotypes and racism that exist here in community as well. You know, I'm 29, I have to stop for a second, am I 29 or am I 30? I'm 29 and, you know, having had experience like violence, but also like racism and, and stereotypes and, and the names that, that follow, I guess, young indigenous women throughout their lives. Um, those also contribute to it, like common mis mis misconceptions and not knowing um, historical relationships and not being able to address them. So I feel like there's a bunch of things that come together in regards to perpetuating these circumstances. Um, and within here, there was a report that Amnesty put out recently called Out of Sight, Out of Mind that talked more about the direct and then the indirect impacts. And when it comes to the community, we are all community members. We mm -hmm. meet all you know nice people as well as those who give us the respect, the support. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the youth part, it's very unfortunate that unfortunately here, the high suicide rates among the Aboriginal youth, they are mm -hmm. around five times more. Mm -hmm. So how can youth be supported more? Is it family? Is it education, training, economics, combination of all? So what can we do to improve, to highlight that part? Mm -hmm. um, there was a study done by Chandler L and Lalonde based out of the University of Victoria and they looked at different cultural factors that are present within communities and how that contributed to the de decrease or increase of youth suicide, so those communities that had all of the cultural factors virtually had no suicide, and those with the lower ones had a lot. Um, I think we're looking at, for me, I know um, creating pathways of empowerment and a platform to create voice, but also when Indigenous people are in school seeing their cultural information and history as we know it specifically like for the region to be reflected in that because I think um, you know one of the core challenges as a young person is navigating identity and finding out who you are and being able to do that within an educational system where sometimes you feel like you don't fit in perpetually I think that will also have a lot to do with with creating a solid pathway forward, but also, you know, working towards that idea of um, reconciliation and building respectful relationships amongst people. Thank you. And again, when it comes to missing persons, so missing person from any community, it hurts. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, when it comes, unfortunately, to the Aboriginal communities, the number of missing and murdered women, mm -hmm. that has been a matter of concern. So what do you think has been done in the last few years, which is excellent, and what could be done more? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, at a grassroots level, we've had the Sisters in Spirit vigils here for, I, I want to say, about eight or nine years now. Um, and the voices, I guess, have been kind of collecting and coming together. And I know that they're supposed to be starting the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Inquiry um, quite soon. But I feel like there needs to be a lot of changes in regards to education because I find that stereotypes and racism and prejudice kind of exists um, under it and even comes out through through media and the way that they portray stories. So um, I think we're on the right track and hopefully we get there. And I think it might take a lot of groundwork from people and I think that idea of change is, or change itself, is, is further down the line. But it's holding on to that hope and faith of like what you're doing today will impact the generations later. So you're, you're creating safety and, and places where they're respected and valued 
later on. Thank you. And do you feel you are getting overall more support from the community? There is more awareness, there are more people willing to help? Um, depending on which regard, like if we look at um, the work that I've done with Sightsee, I've built some amazing community connections. Like I still go and have coffee with farmers and um, people that I really love in community. And it, it was just an amazing experience to see how community comes together and being able to meet people that I normally wouldn't have and build like solid relationships. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, it's given me a lot of Northern pride, I guess. Uh, but when we look at, you know, this, I, this not idea, but the reality of missing and murdered indigenous women and, um, the response of, of community and otherwise, I feel like there's been a bit of a, a backlash where people can almost be like resistant to looking at it or not wanting to because then it might add some type of responsibility and or guilt and or and there's this big thing of like putting your hands back and not wanting to touch it and we need to get past that so we can create change and I personally don't like talking about all of the negative aspects of of living here as an Indigenous woman, but I want to live here and I want my children to be raised here. I have one son right now and my cousins to be raised here. And I fight so hard because I love this place and this is where my people are from. And under all of that, it comes from a place of love. And which are the areas where you feel the government is providing good support and where do you think the government can do a little more? Mm -hmm. um, if we're looking at a like going smaller and then working our way up. So a municipal level, um, you know, there was a lot of good recommendations that c came out of the report and one is increasing invisibility of indigenous populations because, you know, a lot of people can live here and not know that this is done as that territory or it's Treaty 8 territory. Like maybe they can name a, a community, but that's not the same as, as nation either. Um, so I think there needs to be a lot of work at a, at a municipal level in order to make those changes. Um, when we're working outwards, you know, we have the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Inquiry. And I think, I know that there's been a lot of um, criticisms of how that's being handled, but I mean, it's, it's showing that we are moving in the right direction and that change is happening and there's more conversations happening. And you can see people starting to become aware that this is an issue and even, um, not so much as at a government level, but a, a lot of researchers and different reports coming out that can be utilized to create change and tools, or create change and use, be used as tools um, in order to create a pathway forward. And um, being able to have those conversations with, you know, MPs and MLAs and saying like, okay, what can we do? So I can see that in the future happening. Great. And Tell us about some good projects which are going on currently in our Aboriginal communities. Any developmental projects which you find them to be excellent, mm -hmm. which tell us about more hope, which are again supported by people from all ethnic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, well, I know that there's been a lot more regarding sobriety. I'm a big, big advocate for celebrating sobriety because I'm five years, just over five years sober now. And I know that... Uh, BRFN did a sobriety celebration recently, which I thought was amazing. And then more um, work surrounding violence and what that is, but also that commitment to protect Indigenous women, that, that commitment to value and honor our women, which I think is amazing. And if we're looking at the local community, um, there's a young group of poets that are putting on uh, like a poetry slam that focuses on like my violence is not for hurting so ending violence against women and I know that there's going to be some indigenous aspects but it's amazing to see young people also using their voice because I think that's where the change lies is like you said with the young people right and that gives that gives everybody hope when we see that type of thing happening um, and you know I'm sure that there's other various programs that are happening and I know just like the more studies that are happening that can create change too um, because I have an idea in my head like where my master's work is going and my research in translating that into real projects that impact Indigenous people. But, you know, we have uh, 
youth and elders gatherings, which are pretty amazing within the territory where, you know, people from all of the communities come together, urban and rural, and camp, and they do cultural things and, and share, and, you know, there's hunting, and it, for me, that's the highlight, is doing those types of things, and yeah. Great, because youth are our future, you know, all communities, we are all together. Mm -hmm. If we can invest in them, then we have all the hope, we are looking towards a bright future, keeping them motivated, providing them the support, mm -hmm. excellent. And you are a poet also, please tell us about your poem, Your Eyes, The Curve Around Me. I wrote that poem so long ago, and that's like almost like one of my first, I guess, activist um, platforms was through poetry and that poem specifically. So I wrote that poem uh, when I was attending the college and I remember being in class and one of my classmates, she was from one of the communities and her sister had went missing. And during that time within the newspapers, they were saying, oh, well, you know, she lived a risky lifestyle and kind of dismissive of her disappearance, even though they said this wasn't regular. And two weeks later, they found her body in Prince George. And, you know, growing up in a place where, or experiencing prejudice and stereotypes and seeing how it comes together to create this vacuum for Indigenous women to never really be seen for who they are and how um, society's perceptions and also media can create this abyss or this um, invisibility for indigenous women and so that's where that poem came from. Absolutely, there has to be more discussions, more conversations, more support from the media. Mm -hmm. So would you like to recite some poetry here? Yeah, I can um, recite a snippet of the Your Eyes They Curve Around Me poem that we had talked about. Please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, your eyes, they curve around me. I watch you try so hard to find your way past me. Your sight is like rushing waters moving over me, behind me, indirectly consuming me. They say that the path of least resistance makes rivers and men crooked, but I am here. I have resisted. I did not make you crooked. What is it about your false perceptions? What is it about your pockmarked protection? What is it about your misconceptions? What pathologies have you painted the pigment of my skin? What bad medicine did your forefathers use to make me invisible? Thank you. <laughs> and uh, you have won a number of awards. Uh, how do you feel about those recognitions? I always find them super humbling. Like I just feel like I'm a, a northern girl who grew up on a dirt road and so when those things happen um, I'm honored but then it's it's good because then it lends like or builds a, a stronger platform for me to be able to vocalize um, certain things about the different issues that I'm working on and I'm I'm grateful. And what do you think we can do more to support our community? Uh, community investment and you know we're all community members and it takes everybody to to create a place and a space that you know our children can grow up in in respectful peaceful relationships right and so that investment will look different for everybody whether it be through you know donating to the women's resource center or um you know even creating spaces for art because art is amazing. Everybody loves art. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it can look like a multitude of things. And, you know, being kind. And, I, you know, it's funny because through all of my, like, activist things, I always come back to, like, the basis of, like, revolution or the basis of any kind of change is love and holding that love for, for each other and for the community. And that's what it all comes down to. Great. Respecting each other, liking each other, we are in the bigger picture all part of a beautiful global community. Mm -hmm. So how did education help you to gain all the experience which you have now? Um, I really believe in education. I dropped out in grade 11 actually and then it wasn't until I had my son uh, that I went back to school. He was like one, I think I was, tw I was 21 
and finished my grade 12, did my bachelor's degree, and now I'm in my master's program. And when I started at the college level, I remember putting a post-it in all of my binders saying like, it was a statistic and it said, something like 50% of single mothers live below the poverty line. And I was like, you know what, that's not gonna be me. And education is the key into like unlocking doors and possibilities. And it has so far, you know, I think I've been offered opportunities that I couldn't have imagined before. And, you know, that's education mixed with like purpose and blind passion almost because my father scolds me often like, you shouldn't be doing everything for free. Don't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, But, you know, if my, my heart's there, you know, and if it lines up with, with my integrity, then being able to take those. But education, um, you know, there's so much out there to learn and to evolve as as a person and um, I remember growing up and not knowing like what a bachelor's degree was or what a master's degree is and now I have a, a son who's nine and I'm like okay so how many years does it take for this how many years does it take for this and like these are your options and even you know with the election and me not knowing anything until I was like 21 taking political science and not voting until then um, being able to talk with my son and he can name off like, okay, well, these are the MLAs and this is, you know, the difference between MPs and um, how education has that ability to also transform generations and change courses, I guess. Excellent point. Education is the key to development. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And please tell us about some event where people come together regardless of the race and it's a very pleasant, nice event in which there is multiculturalism and there is support from all community members. I really like, you know, some of the different celebrations. I love the the party in the park that the Evangel Chapel puts on like year after year. I find that one to be just amazing. Um, just because in the, the amount of love and giving that goes into that. I like taking my son to that um, specific event. I like going to the the powwow that we have. It's usually in, in Taylor too, and that's you know welcome to everybody, and everybody can come to that. And I love that um, celebration of uh, multiculturalism. And I know that they've been doing more events here as of as of late as well um, in open public spaces, which uh, I think is amazing. And we need more of that. And the vagina monologues. I love that. Great. Thank you. So thank you for coming to our program and we wish you all the best. Thank you for having me. Welcome.